Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm Kira Butler, Senior Editor at Mother Jones, and I'm sure you can all relate when I say that I am reeling from the last week of news. As we watched in horror as our democracy came under attack, it was easy to forget that the coronavirus is still raging with 4,000 new cases every day. But these two events are related in one really important way. The people who stormed the Capitol live in an alternate reality. Their beliefs are reinforced by dangerous conspiracy theories shared in online communities. That same dynamic, the online spread of misinformation, has worsened the pandemic. So how do we stem the tide of dangerous rumors? My guest today, Dr. Sima Yasmin, has thought a lot about that question. Dr. Yasmin is a professor of primary care and population health at Stanford University. She previously served in the Epidemic Intelligence Service at the CDC, investigating infectious disease outbreaks. But her brilliance doesn't stop there. Dr. Yasmin is also an Emmy Award-winning journalist whose recent work focuses on the spread of medical misinformation. Her new book is called Viral BS, Medical Myths and Why We Fall for Them. Today, we'll talk about how coronavirus misinformation flows, the dangers it poses, and what the incoming administration can do about it. We'll reserve the last part of our time with Dr. Yasmin for your questions. If you're following on Facebook, Twitter, or YouTube, just drop questions into the comment field and I'll ask them. Dr. Sima Yasmin, welcome. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me, Kira. How are you doing? I'm good. I mean, all things considered. So I'm, right. I'm really curious, what was your reaction to the events of last week and continuing into today? <sighs> Shock, but not surprised, because it was like, what did people think was going to happen, given the rhetoric from, you can say last year, right, about the stop the steal and the encouragement that was given to people about delegitimizing the election results and the democratic process. But really, you can say there's been tens of years, hundreds of years, like leading up to this. And so many signs from many people, I would say, especially Black people, Indigenous people, people of color, and those messages, that communication, that scholarly work, that work or, and happening in communities, it wasn't heeded by many people. And so I think that's why I say shock, because it's horrible. People died. And as we learn more information about what happened at the Capitol and allegations of some representatives doing like reconnaissance tours for people and, and um, perhaps some, I think Ayanna Presley, there were no panic buttons in her room anymore, in her office anymore. That we can still be really horrified and shocked by that. But the surprise element, I'm a bit like, I think many of us saw something really, really bad like this happening. So the comparison that I made in my opening remarks between these twin crises of the threat to our democracy and to our health. Does that square with what you've observed? Yes. And I'll be really careful here to say I'm not a political scientist, right? I'm a public health physician, but I'm someone who over the last five or six years has started to look a lot more closely at not just disease contagion, but information contagion. So the parallels between how a virus might spread from person to person, and then very broadly, and then also how information, how a tweet, how a Pinterest meme that might have anti-vaccine sentiments, Pinterest is really bad for this, how those things might spread from one person to another, and then more broadly. So there are parallels between disease spread and information contagion as well. And it's been frustrating for me, I think, for and for many people in this space, that public health agencies and other establishments have not taken the information aspect seriously for many years and now are seeing, oh, okay, that can also be a threat to public health. It's not just a pathogen that threatens our public health. It's the misinformation and disinformation about the disease, about the vaccine, about the pandemic that can undo everything you're trying to do in public health. And I say I'm not a political scientist because I, of course, use the work that comes from political science and social psychology. And I mention it in viral BS quite a few times. And that those studies about our cognitive biases, about why we have particular beliefs why those beliefs might seem really solid, even in the face of someone pushing and saying, hey, but I have evidence counter to what you believe. A lot of my understanding about that and my application of it to health and science does come from looking at the work of political scientists and social psychologists. 
That's really interesting. So, and it makes me think of our our next question, um, which is about social media platforms and how they think about how this this stuff spreads. Um, over the past few months, uh, we've seen some of these social media platforms tighten up their policies around misinformation with limited success. So I'm wondering what you think about this. Is it effective for, say, Facebook or Twitter to simply label posts that contain misinformation, or do you recommend deleting them? I would say that these social media platforms really acutely understand how information spreads. They know the mechanics of this. And actually, in many cases, their algorithms, and I'm thinking especially about Facebook, their algorithms incentivize engagement with false information. There, there's a really good report you can look at for some of the specific numbers that came from Arvaz. If you look at arvaz.org, I think the, uh, the report came out in like September of last year. I wrote an op-ed for the New York Times about it to show, look how powerful the misinformation and disinformation that spreads on social media is because the focus of my op-ed was doctors who fall for the COVID hoaxes and say things like, but I saw it on Facebook that hydroxychloroquine works or that this other thing does not work. Um, and that report that I reference in the op-ed shows you how huge this problem is and that when the medical establishments and the World Health Organizations and others are trying to counter it now, um, I think it's too little, too late. I think it's a bit amateurish and it's not deploying some of the strategies we know can be very effective in communications. Um, but they are just not getting as many eyeballs on their websites. And that's what the Avaz report and others have shown that look how powerful Facebook and Twitter and others are. The false information that travels on some of the best known sites, uh, sites or groups, you know, on pages on Facebook, for example, will get 10 times as many views as some of the World Health Organization and CDC factual information. But in response to your question a bit more directly, the social media platforms know that this is an issue, I think, for the longest time they've been saying, well, we, we just employed more fact checkers. Oh, well, we're just going to add tags. Actually, the analysis shows so much crap that stays up without the tags that they say will get added. Now, of course, we're seeing deplatforming Twitter um, and also YouTube. And I think obviously there's more of a discussion to be had. But again, not coming from me as a social media expert, but just my analysis of how this can play into the impact on public health. Yeah, that makes sense. The standard advice from the scientific community on combating misinformation is to just stick to the facts. But right. in your book, you really challenge that idea. Can you say more about that? Yes, I find this so frustrating. I mean, there's so many examples, but I'll just like give you one. Uh, a couple of years ago, there was a really bad measles outbreak in Eastern Europe, I think in Romania. And at the time, World Health Organization had tweeted something like, worst measles outbreak in decades currently in this part of Eastern Europe. Don't worry, we are disseminating pamphlets something along those lines, right? I'm paraphrasing. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like the, these movements of anti-vaccine messages and uh, vaccine hesitancy, they're not disseminating pamphlets to get their point across. They are sending videos of a mother crying to the camera and say, telling you because she's convinced that her three-year-old became autistic after getting the MMR vaccine. Are you telling me that with a video like that, that's a person telling a story about a child crying, it's super emotional, you're telling me you're gonna counter that with some bullet points on a leaflet? That does not meet people where they are. And so some of what really frustrates me, Kira, is you know, I, I trained in medicine and in medical school, and this is around the world, we practice evidence-based medicine but we don't practice evidence-based communication, even though we know that communication is make or break when it comes to convincing an individual patient. Communication is everything in epidemic response or pandemic response. And yet there are scholars over here and over here who have decades of evidence for us about what works and what does not work. And yet we just keep repeating what we think works, even though the pamphlets, the facts, delivered from us or delivered in a one size fits all message. I mean, that's rubbish. It just goes over the heads of so many people. It doesn't atone for the fact that we in medicine, whether we were directly involved or not, a part of an establishment that has a really bloody and unethical history of experimentation on very vulnerable people, that even now, this isn't just about history, medical racism is very much a thing now. 
But also, if you talk to six people, and I'll say people who are vaccine hesitant, because even though I study anti-vaccine movements, they're more of a fringe, you know? I think the majority of are people who are on the fence, like, oh, I got my flu shot last year, but not sure if I should get COVID-19 vaccine this year. Those people, if you interviewed six of them, would have six different reasons, historical, cultural, religious, all of that for being vaccine hesitant. So we have to meet people where they are. Yes, we need national campaigns, but we need hyper-localized communications campaigns too. Yes, I I certainly agree. And I think um, our Facebook audience is also wondering about this. Um, we have um, Paige Else on Facebook uh, with a question. She wants to understand why so many health professionals are refusing their COVID vaccine. Yeah. I was not that surprised by this. And I'll tell you why. One of the first outbreaks I investigated when I moved to America 10 years ago and joined the Epidemic Intelligence Service was an outbreak of whooping cough in a neonatal intensive care unit. So you think, wait, these are like the most vulnerable babies, right? Vulnerable patients in the entire hospital that in a NICU, they're not really going in and out. How did this whooping cough outbreak spread and nearly kill them? And long story short, through my investigation, we found that it was quite likely infected healthcare workers who were going to work while they had the cough of whooping cough, they weren't vaccinated, they were coughing over the babies. I mean, first question I'll just get out of the way is we need to have better sick pay and better sick pay and leave policies so that people don't lose money for taking time off or don't lose their PTO, right? Because so these folks were really coming to work knowing they were contagious, but didn't because their PTO and their sick pay was all lumped together, um, didn't want to take time off. And I, I'll just say that again, because in the context of the pandemic, it's a thing we need to talk about more, pay people to stay at home because we have folks who are infectious and going to work, right? And spreading the disease to others. But back to this point about there being healthcare workers who are not vaccinated, they didn't want anyone telling them what to do. They did not want their whooping cough booster shot. And then as a journalist, a few years later, I started looking into this more and I was like, wait, so there are some counties and some hospitals that mandate particular shots. And when you look at the opposition that's occurred in the face of those mandates, it's come from nurses unions. It's come from healthcare workers who are like, don't you dare tell us what vaccine we should and shouldn't get. So when this happened with COVID-19 and from some accounts, um, I think the Ohio governor said the other day that about 50 to 60% of staff in long-term care facilities are refusing the vaccine. They're not all necessarily healthcare workers, right? But still folks who work with very vulnerable people, I think in Los Angeles counties and others, we've heard about nurses asking to not be vaccinated. It comes back to this idea that we are very much influenced by the beliefs of those around us that an erroneous belief that we hold can be really bolstered and protected when it's not an isolated belief. And that often we are pushed to believe things because it's safe to believe that because it gives you a feeling of community. It means you belong to something. And that's, it sounds simple or it sounds weird, but it's a very powerful motivator in terms of what we do and don't believe. You might think healthcare workers have seen patients die from COVID-19. They know how real this is, but they are still people. And you'd be surprised. I feel there's very good breakdowns of um, political affiliation among different specialties of healthcare workers, which is very interesting, um, especially for me as a Brit coming from a national health system to a, an American system that's very different. But we've seen doctors fall for hoaxes. I know of doctors who prescribe drugs that don't work for COVID-19 and tell people it will prevent them getting COVID-19. So this is certainly not just an issue of the lay public. The misinformation and disinformation absolutely permeates people in the healthcare profession for those reasons. That's really interesting. And especially given what you said before about um, the emotional nature of a lot of anti-vaccine groups messaging, do you have any ideas for how we can re-message this to healthcare workers, how we can get them as a community behind the vaccine instead of opposing it? Yeah, and I, I think it does require different strategies for different groups of people. I will say that when I teach science communication to scientists, epidemiologists, I have to say, we like our evidence. So let me show you some of the evidence that comes from the communications field that shows that the way that we currently do it, which is, oh, there's something you don't know, and I have the information, I'm gonna bridge that knowledge gap by translating this information into a way that's good for you. And then by delivering it, you're gonna believe it. 
and you're going to change a behavior. And it's like, no, there's decades of scholarship that shows we have so many cognitive biases that get in the way of that. Confirmation bias, assimilation bias, actually what's been demonstrated, there's evidence to show that you use narrative techniques to communicate about science. And that's like storytelling techniques of using a character, having a plot. It sounds so woo-woo to scientists, but what I have to say, especially when I train epidemiologists, is like, I'm an epidemiologist, I get it. We love data sets, we love millions of data points. To us, one story is like, it could be an outlier, it's a single data point. In fact, when I was finishing up my work at CDC and going to journalism school, one of my colleagues was like making fun of me and he was like, oh, you're going to be one of those science journalists that writes anecdotal leads about Mrs. Patel had a headache and it turned out to be this virus because there's such a like a disdain for the single story, except that's what works when you're trying to compel people to believe something, to take in new information, and you want to affect behavior change. But that just sounds like that's not sciencey if you're telling a story. And it's like, think about the ways that you as a human have been swayed or moved or felt emotional. It's when you're watching a film or a documentary and there is an anecdotal and a personal component to it. So I really try and move people towards using narrative techniques. And I'm like, there is evidence. Look, like I said, we practice evidence-based medicine please practice evidence-based communication. There's all this scholarship that shows using the storytelling techniques will work. And that's just a condensed version of an answer because I think there's so many other strategies we have to employ as well. Absolutely. Um, one of our uh, Facebook audience members um, has a follow-up question, and it makes me think about what you were saying about um, political affiliation of different kinds of um, healthcare workers. Yeah. Um, and this is, you know, this applies to all people, not just healthcare workers. But do you see any way to depoliticize the effort to combat COVID nineteen, whether it's with social distancing, um, you know, wearing masks, or the vaccine? The thing is. This is such a horrific event that we're all going through. I mean, the numbers of deaths, it's just kind of really hard to get your head around it at this point. And it's, even though there are massive disparities, it's still something that everyone could feel impacts them. And so on many levels, I feel like, this could have been a really unifying event for the country, us against the virus, right? And it's been anything but, it's been used to drive deeper divisions. I am really careful talking about politics and public health in that I say public health is inherently political. Um, but then I think all of life is. And I think one of the traps we fall into as scientists is trying to be like, I'm a scientist, therefore I am neutral, I am objective. And I'm like, no, you're not. You walked into your clinic as a human, not a robot, I take it. And therefore you took all of your biases and all of your life experiences and the way that you walk through the world with you. Um, and so I don't see a way of like easily depoliticizing it, but I do think a lot about how this could have been, been a unifying event where it doesn't matter which side you may sit on, you are vulnerable of becoming infected. And of course, then we get into even more fascinating political science research about knowledge levels and public health behavior of people who watch Fox News and who skew conservative versus those who skew progressive. So it gets really interesting. I'd love it if you could elaborate on that a little bit. It sounds really interesting. So I'm sure people have heard about the Fox News effect more generally because it's a thing that's been studied in the journalism field for many years. But more recently, and especially last summer, there was research that came out at the University of Chicago. There were a number of studies actually and they were looking at the likelihood that a person would adhere to things like lockdown measures, mask wearing, physical distancing, based on where they skewed politically and where they got their news from. And not even that, they went quite granular and they looked at, you may watch Fox News, but do you watch Tucker Carlson or do you watch Hannity? And then based on that, based on zip code data, they said that there were people who skewed more conservative and who watched Fox News who were less likely to adhere to those public health measures. And also, um, did this study come out of the University of Chicago? You can find it quite easily by looking, but it found the knowledge level and the risk that people felt that COVID-19, you know, the threat it posed on them was lower. The knowledge was lower, the threat perception was lower for those who skewed conservative. There's a lot of data out there. Again, I'm not a political scientist, but I watch that really carefully because I'm always thinking about the impact of those things on my field, on public health and whether people will listen to or not listen to public health advice and guidance. It seems like all of that backs up what what we've 
been hearing all of these last this last year, these last few years about the idea of echo chambers, that people are constantly being served news that reinforces their own political beliefs. Yeah, and I have some brave friends and colleagues, Kira, who um, they're public health physicians or they're vaccine scientists. They've gotten death threats because they work on vaccines, um, but they've decided they are going to go on Fox News and they are going to go on to media platforms, written or television, where they think they're going to get skewered, but because they are so desperate to break out of that echo chamber, they know that when they tweet, when they put something on Facebook, if they write an op-ed for the New York Times, they have an idea of who's going to read it. And they're like, how do we get past that? Because otherwise we're just kind of preaching to the choir. How do we permeate the other echo chambers? But certainly none of what we're talking about is brand new in terms of misinformation or disinformation, even health hoaxes in particular. But I think social media has certainly allowed the amplification and acceleration of that and allowed us to create even bigger echo chambers. I think we've done that as a people for centuries. It's safe. It makes sense. Let's all believe the same thing. and We have the same values. Um, and therefore, we have a sense of belonging and a sense of safety. But with social media, you can do that on an even greater scale. One thing that I thought was really interesting to read about in your book uh, was your upbringing. Um, The subject of misinformation for you isn't just an academic interest. In your book, you tell this anecdote about growing up in a tight-knit immigrant community in England, and you tie that to your interest in researching conspiracy theories. Could you say a little more about that? Yeah, and I will say, you know, when you're writing a book, you're kind of writing on your own, and then it goes out in the world, and you're like, why did I tell everyone (laughs) I grew up a conspiracy theorist? But I think it's important for people to know that there can be movement and evolution. And also, like you said, it's really grounded me and helped me understand a bit more about where people come from. And the reason I bring it up right at the beginning of the book, um, partly as a kind of like confession, like, hey, here are some ridiculous things I used to believe and that people in my community believed, is because what we believed was absurd. Things like the royal family wasn't human, like ridiculous things, because, you know, about people in power mostly. But here's why it was believable. So I give this one anecdote in the book about how on my cousin's bedroom wall, he had a map of the world. And every country that had been colonized by Britain was colored in pink. And it was a lot of the world. And I think by some historians measurements, they say one in three or one in four people at one point was a subject of the British empire. So as a little girl, I'd look at my big cousin's map and I would think, How did this one island nation, it's tiny and it's up north, how, like how did they exert such power and pillage so much of the world? And it doesn't seem believable, it's so absurd. And so to me, that helped me understand there are so many things that have happened historically or even in recent years, even happening now that are true and they are absurd. They are ridiculous, they are almost too bizarre to be true, but they are. And therefore, when you think about conspiracy theories, they are absurd. The royal family are not shape-shifting reptiles, which is what some of the books I read when I was a teenager, right, said. But at the same time, it was believable because other absurd things actually had happened and because others in my environment reinforced that and because we didn't much like the royal family, right, because we had, my family had a very direct uh, experience of what the British colonialization of colonization of India did to them and to our family. And so it's it's deep, right? And it's complicated, but it's humbling to, I think, tell people like, hey, that was me and now I study misinformation and disinformation. But there's a, a re- public health researcher called Nat Jenis, who I work with at a, this, a company called Me Down. And one of her favorite questions to ask people, and I've taken this on too, is especially to other people who study misinformation and disinformation, Nat always says to them, so what's something that you believe that was really false? And everyone has something. And it might even be a current thing. There might be someone who's like, oh, I go to a chiropractor for adjustments, even though there's no evidence of that. But it makes me feel better. Like we all have that. And I think it's very grounding, humbling, and human and important to be like, yeah, this stuff I've believed, you know, maybe I still do believe. Yeah. What did that experience that you had growing up uh, teach you about communities that we are now seeing that seem to be especially vulnerable to misinformation? It taught me that you can't do all this work from the outside. Like, please don't assume that you have some innate trustability, if that's the way, you know what I mean? Like, you need to work with the communities. They know 
how they think. They know who the stakeholders are. You need to work with trusted leaders in my community that would be imams or other scholars, people who understand the dynamics, know the way that you get messages out. I think there's so much elitism. And one of the reasons I went into um, journalism was because I thought medicine was so elitist. And it was like, we have all the answers. We know the information. We'll give you what you need to know. And it was like, no, tell people everything. Tell people the process, how we come to these decisions, empower them to make up their mind. But I still see that kind of elitism. It's like, we have the information. We'll give it to you. It's like, please work with the people in the community. The work that they are doing is just as evidence-based as what you do in a lab or in your tightly controlled studies. Um, you know, their lived experiences are data and they know that. So respect it and work with them and give them the support they need. Well, and I think it's also so much about acknowledging the trauma and the abuse that some of these communities have experienced historically. Yeah, and, and that is coming up more and more now. Since last year, we had so many traumatic things happen. And of course, it was the continued murders of Black people and Indigenous people, people of colour at the hands of racists and at the hands of police who were racist. Um, and I think one thing that can happen based on that, we had more conversations about the Tuskegee experiments of untreated syphilis and poor Black sharecroppers in Alabama and all of these really egregious things that had happened at the hands of doctors, at the hands of US government doctors, came up and it's good let's talk about that awful history let's hold to account those who allowed that to happen but please let's not just talk about it in historical terms because it's very much a continuing thing black people's pain still goes underdiagnosed and undertreated we have data about how white medical students and white doctors you know just from a few years ago at the university of virginia and elsewhere how they hold magical beliefs about black people's bodies about black people's skin being like it's just ridiculous and it's so dangerous that people in power hold these magical false beliefs those are the people who we are expecting everyone to trust like we without dismantling some of that without saying yes I am a doctor I therefore work within a system that is inherently racist historically racist built on experimentation on enslaved black people how dare you just go and say we need more black people to sign up to clinical trials like why why aren't they or we need black people to accept the vaccine like you better do the work with those communities to allow that to happen Dr. Yasmin, I have to break into our questions here because we have some real breaking news. I was so, so stressed about this. What's the news? I think all of our audience members are stressed about this too, so I'm sure everybody will be very interested to hear this. According to the AP, the House of Representatives now has enough votes, a majority, to impeach President Trump. Wow. This is the first time in history a president has been impeached twice. So... I want I do wow. want to connect this this monumental news back to the topic at hand here a little bit. And I want to ask you, is this an appropriate repudiation of that campaign, an inkling of hope that this went too far, that there are boundaries? I, I mean, I have questions about what does this mean now, though? What does it mean will happen? What does it mean can't happen? Um, it's certainly movement. It's certainly momentum. I was watching the articles of impeachment debate earlier on, heard some ridiculous things said by some uh, Republican members during that debate about cancel culture. And if the president's canceled, all of us will be canceled. Um, so a glimmer of hope possibly, but based on what you, the breaking news alert you just gave us that we've all kind of been thinking about today, but I still need to understand more about, okay, so what next? And then uh, even the best case scenarios involve such long processes of reconciliation uh, and resolution and healing, right? Um, and I do have faith that people can do that work, um, but in the short term, I'm wondering how this will pan out, especially because I wonder if this fuels those who are telling us that they feel marginalized as white, middle, upper class Americans, as cis men, for example, they feel othered right now. And so I wonder how this news will register with them and what that means for our physical safety for the next few days, you know, and weeks. I think about that in very real terms as well. We can have political debates, but what does it mean for the safety of especially black and brown Americans right now? Absolutely. And I also wonder about how whether this is going to what's this going to mean for the echo chambers that we were talking about before? 
Um, you know, there are and huge the implications you, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the way that you and I might discuss this now and the way after this, I will I will go and watch Fox News and some other, you know, to see how it's being reported there. But it's often so stark, isn't it? And you you, you wonder about that too, where people are getting their news from and, and how that's reverberating through their particular echo chambers and, and then how that might manifest for the rest of us. Absolutely. So... I do want to I want to turn this into like a little bit of a forward looking um, end to our, this part of our conversation. And I want to ask you, you know, we, we've we talked so much uh, so far in this conversation about um, the problems that we're seeing about this. You know, we talked about historical um, mistrust because of a history of abuse and trauma. We talked about, you know, the problem of echo chambers. We've talked about, you know, the need for. Um, stronger messaging to healthcare workers and the general public, and you know the importance of depoliticizing um, COVID nineteen misinformation. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, we we do have a new president coming in. We have a new administration who has a real opportunity to turn things around. What are some ways that you think that the Biden administration can do that? So I look at some of the people that they have hired, both for their COVID task force, for their COVID-19 response team, the fact that they have set up a committee, I think chaired by Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith, to look specifically at the issues of health disparity. And that starts to give me an inkling of how the next months and years might look different in terms of agenda setting, in terms of who's at the table and what the issues are that are being discussed. And so I think there's potential there to heal some rifts and to do some of that community work, to give resources to those on the ground who are already working on issues around anti-Black racism, around public health, around health disparities. So those are some of the things that I look at. I mean, they have their work cut out. So much of it in ways feels like scorched earth slash sabotage. Um, they have to fix so much in the short term, even thinking about the vaccine program uh, and trying to fix what's been broken there. Um, and so, yeah, the, I guess there's short-term ways of looking at it and long-term ways, but who they have at the table, the agenda they're setting starts to give me some, some hope. People are feeling really concerned about the pace of this vaccine rollout. Um, yeah. are, are you and, and your colleagues feeling confident that it can things can pick up with the release of more vaccines and um, combined with better messaging? I do think it can pick up. I think so many of us said from a communications perspective, Operation Warp Speed is a really bad name. It sounds like throw all caution to the wind, to heck with safety, warp speed ahead. Doesn't to me, tell me if anyone disagrees with this, but it doesn't really engender feelings of trust or safety or confidence in the process. It's just warp speed. But not only that, now it hasn't delivered the warp speed in terms of, yes, the scientists did their job. They did work at really record speed to develop vaccines in a way that we haven't seen before. But then what? So the whole time that that vaccine development is happening in the lab, in clinical trials, that's when you have to get your communication programs ready too. I keep saying, you know, it's not a vaccine and vials that ends the pandemic. It's the vaccine when it's injected into us. So that step is absolutely critical. And Operation Warp Speed hasn't done that. I think there's been a lot of miscommunication. Sometimes they've apologized, sometimes they haven't, but also false promises, right? 20 million Americans will be vaccinated by the end of December, 2020. That didn't happen. It was far from that. And that in and of itself can engender distrust because those people, remember I was saying like vaccine, anti-vaccine movements are kind of fringe. They're relatively smallish, but there are many more people who might be vaccine hesitant. And so while you're trying to talk about ingredients in the vaccine and about how the vaccine works, if the government isn't delivering in the way that it said it would, the vaccine isn't coming out at the rate and it isn't being delivered in that way, that can really engender distrust too. You're like, wait, it doesn't look like we know what we're doing. Is it going to be two doses spaced out the way it was in the trial? Is it going to be different? Like that's really, that has a bad impact on trust and on mass rollout. But I do think it can be fixed. We have even states like West Virginia doing much better than a lot of other states. And I think some of the lessons there are really good in terms of like West Virginia knowing what works, saying we're going to work with these specific pharmacies because they already have relationships with nursing homes and care homes, 
So I think giving states, not leaving them, leaving them in the lurch, which is what has happened, but giving them support and allowing them to come up with plans that work for them, I think that can be very empowering and it can speed things up. At the rate we're going, though, we'd be here for many years before we reach herd immunity, so it has to step up. We've heard all through this pandemic from the Trump administration, the vaccine's going to save us. You know, soon there will be this silver bullet and we'll all get to go back to life as we knew it before. So is there a risk in making everything about the vaccine in general? We'll still need other measures, too, right? Yeah, definitely. And especially as we gather more information about how long immunity lasts, for example. But, you know, right now we don't know much about whether the vaccine makes you not contagious. So the clinical trials told us that if you get the vaccine, your chances of getting severe COVID and getting sick with COVID are much lower, which is great, but you could still become infected, just not sick, but you could still potentially pass it on to others. So there has to be communication around that too, right? That, hey, you got your shot, congratulations. You got one, you're not fully immunized. You got two, you're going to start to get fully immunized. But even then, please wear a mask please do physical distancing. And I think, you know, in the in the last few months, oftentimes when I got asked that question about when will a vaccine be available, I think the subtext was when will things go back to normal? And it was like, oh, those are two different things though, because even with vaccines rolled out, we need upwards of like, what, 260, maybe 300 million Americans, you know, so a very high proportion of Americans to get vaccinated for us to have herd immunity. And in the interim, it's like you said, vaccines plus good hand hygiene, vaccines plus, physical distancing, mask wearing, things like that. I want to end our conversation on a really positive note. So I want to hear about what is giving you hope right now. Um, What have you heard in the news? What have you heard from the Biden administration? Um, What are some positive developments that are kind of keeping you going? Honestly, nothing in the news. (laughs) I don't think. I think, you know, especially last year when really egregious things, in my opinion, were happening at FDA in terms of rushed emergency use authorizations for some treatments, the president tweeting to the FDA director, you need to hurry up. And then the FDA director, I feel buckling under that pressure. That was really unsettling to me. And also when CDC was producing guidance and we learned it was being censored and changed by the administration, that was frightening too, because normally what do you say? Go to FDA.gov, go to CDC.gov, like you get trusted evidence-based information there. But even then, when that was so unsettling and so unnerving, what gave me faith and hope was remembering, I used to work at CDC, there are tens of thousands of staff epidemiologists there who really care, who are really diligent, who when this administration comes and goes are gonna carry on working so hard. Same at FDA, there were even some staff, like career scientists there who were like, if we are told to change things because of political agendas, we will speak out and we will leave. That's what gave me hope and some some nights of sleep. So we we do have another little bit of breaking news, a little update here. Um, and this I is an interesting speak. point to end on. Um, Speaker Pelosi has just gaveled. The president has been impeached. Wow. Wow. This is history happening. It is this history is happening. And um, I'm sure that all of our um, audience members on Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and other platforms are wanting to get back to the news. Um, um, yeah. So Me too. I'm like, what does this mean? What happens next? I Some know. I know. Well, well, we'll all be glued to the screen um, for the foreseeable future, more, more so than we are already. Um, but Dr. Yasmin, I wanted to take a minute just to say a big thank you to you um, for filling us in on the origins of misinformation, why it's so dangerous, and what we can do to stop its spread. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us today, Dr. Yasmin. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kira, and thanks for your reporting, too. And thank you for the huge historical breaking news alerts throughout our conversation. What a time. Thanks also uh, to our audience for joining us today. Um, If you want to watch this conversation again, we'll be posting it on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And we will continue to cover misinformation and coronavirus, among other things, at motherjones.com. Dr. Seema Yasmin's new book is called Viral BS, Medical Myths and Why We Fall for Them. Thanks, everyone. See you next time.